afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you and, and uh, go ahead and get started. We're glad to have you here. Today is April 25th, 2023 for Psychiatric Grand Rounds. We are delighted to have all of you here and want to let you know if you learned of this from a friend or from a social media post, and if you'd like to join our email list, please email Francis McKinney in order to do so. Uh, my name is Carol Reynolds Ingram. I'm a therapist at Cottage for our employees and their families. And Frances McKinney is our administrative coordinator. And eventually I will introduce you to Petra. And now I'd invite you to direct your attention to our administrative coordinator, Frances McKinney, as she will define implicit, implicit bias for us. Thank you. Okay, the definition of implicit bias in healthcare. Definition is attitudes or internalized stereotypes affecting perceptions, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Evidence of implicit bias exists in healthcare and contributes to unequal treatment of people based on race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, disability, and other characteristics. Implicit bias contributes to health disparities by affecting the behavior of physicians, nurses, physician assistants, and other healthcare workers. Implicit bias impacts treatment decisions and outcomes. And now I'll read a couple of examples of implicit bias. A recent study used audio recording of potential psychotherapy clients to show that middle-class white women are far more likely than working-class African-American men to get a call back when requesting an appointment. Even with standardized diagnostic criteria in the DSM-5, providers of mental health services are more likely to underdiagnose effective disorders and overdiagnose psychotic disorders among patients from marginalized groups compared with the majority. Thank you. And now to introduce Petra Bomer. Petra Bomer received, or Boimer, excuse me, received her master's degree in behavioral psychology at the University of Hamburg in Germany. She is a mindful eating and emotional self-help expert with over two decades in counseling and mental health promotion experience. Her passion is to help clients be at peace with food and their bodies and to practice good emotional self-care. Petra taught weight loss classes for over four years at a local clinic and has given several talks on weight regulation and emotional eating, both to hospitals as well as to corporations. She has given several talks for the American Heart Association on the topic of stress and emotional eating and has facilitated mindfulness sessions for the employees of Santa Barbara County. Petra's specialty areas are weight management, emotional eating, and self-care. In her work, she combines cognitive behavioral therapy with mindfulness, and self-compassion practices. So Petra, if you would like to share your screen, I'd like to welcome you to Psychiatric Grand Rounds. Thank you, Carol and Francis and Darcy to invite me to present on a topic that is my life's calling and my passion. Uh, the title obviously is Mindfulness-Based Weight Loss Intervention. So we will be exploring what causes emotional eating. Hopefully I will be able to ignite sparks of hope to any listener who is struggling with weight or has struggled with weight and body image issues since childhood. As Carol said, I love questions and answers. I will pause throughout the presentation and take your questions. And I will also give you time to process because I have a lot of information. But before we go into the presentation, I'd like to do a short grounding meditation with all of you, just a minute or two. So whatever you're doing, drop it, <laughs> close your eyes and uncross your legs and allow yourself for a moment to simply focus on your breathing. Take beautiful, deep, breaths in and out. 
with nowhere to go and nothing to do. As you're softly landing in this moment, and thoughts will come and go, which you can label thinking. Gently come back to your breathing over and over again. Allowing your nervous system to relax. Allowing your body to relax. As you're unplugging from the external world for a moment and tuning into your inner world. In the middle of the day, taking a mindful pause. And the mind drifts off, gently come back to your breathing. As you're grounding yourself in this present moment. A few more deep breaths, and then start re-energizing your body. Maybe wiggle your toes, roll your shoulders, or stretch, and open your eyes. And we'll go into the presentation now. If you or anyone you know struggles with weight, you're not alone. 70, if not more percent of Americans are overweight or obese at this time. And one third of lost weight is often regained in the first year of treatment. As we know, being um, overweight has health consequences. However, there is hope for anyone who's tired of dieting. I often get calls from clients who say, Petra, I don't have another diet in me. And I said, okay, let's do this. We know research confirms that relapse rates are very high. Diets work short term and then they don't. And if I were with you in a live setting, I would have you raise hands and tell me what gets in the way after you diet and then the weight comes back on. I often hear clients say, well, life just happens. And we'll explore what to do when life happens. Again, more data. I will not um, overload you with data today or, or evidence-based research, but I do some. So as we know, high risk of failure and weight regain, emotional eating is a missing component in traditional weight loss programs. This is where I come in. So my story from weight loss coach to self-care counselor, I wrote once I left the clinic about six years ago, I had a strong calling to start my own business, which I call the Mindful Eating Institute, with a desire to help people have a healthy and more importantly, relaxed relationship with food. It's important that we understand the core emotions that make a client reach for food when they're not physically hungry. So after I started my own business, I wrote a little blog post, a newsletter called Confessions of a Former Weight Loss Coach. So how did Petra come from being the assertive weight loss coach to now being a self-care counselor? And I'd like to read this, it's very short. I used to be a rather assertive weight loss coach assisting and urging clients to follow a very strict diet. 
I did this successfully for over four years. In my past, I also taught smoking cessation classes and helped smokers get off the most addictive drug known to men, nicotine. One client quoted me in a joking manner and said, Petra rules with an iron fist. My heart was always in the right place. After all, we were dealing with addiction, a world where one thinks in black and white terms. I myself grew up in a household where addiction was omnipresent, alcohol and cigarettes. And as a counselor, I was finally able to do something about it and help my clients live a healthier and longer life. Now, in contrast to all addictive substances, food is a different beast altogether. We need to eat and nourish our bodies to survive. So how do we free ourselves from using food to numb, to take the edge off and cope with our emotions? Diets fail, in my opinion, when emotional eating is not addressed. Diets further disconnect a person from their internal cues to physical, hun physical hunger from emotional hunger. So what are you truly hungry for? What does your hungry heart tell you? That is the true path out of food addiction and obsession. In my work, I teach clients to be present with difficult feelings, to get comfortable with discomfort. As a client stated correctly during a group session, feelings won't kill us. So we're going to explore a lot more throughout this presentation. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background how I shifted personally and professional through a major life event in my own life to work more from the heart to um, offer clients a heart-centered treatment model versus restrictive dieting. And I truly believe none of us needs more discipline. We all need more nurturing. If you agree, raise your hand and I hope I can see it somewhere. Little video for you to enjoy. At this point, I'd like you, and I'll quote it again. A, my favorite self-care quote is by a young poet named Brianna Wiest. And she says, self-care is not salt baths and chocolate cake. It's making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. Self-care is not chocolate, it's not a soft baths and chocolate cake. It's making the choice to build a life you don't regularly need to escape from. On NPR, I listened to an interview yesterday um, by a psychiatrist named Dr. Pooja Lakshmin. I can give you the name later. And she said, you can't meditate yourself out of a 40 hour work week with no childcare and no paid sick days. And I wanna add, or out of an abusive marriage or relationship. So self-care is very complex and it's much more than getting our mani-pedi and getting our hair done. So we'll take a deeper dive into what needs to happen for us to let go of emotional eating. So this is a survey of 1,328, not 1,329 psychologists. They were asked which strategies are essential to losing weight and keeping it off. And as you can read, understanding, managing the behaviors and emotions are important and emotional eating is a huge barrier to weight loss. And cognitive therapy, problem solving and mindfulness are very good strategies. And it's, imp it's important to understand the complexity and the need, the underlying core emotion that drives a person to the refrigerator late at night after they had a big meal. And we'll go into that. I have several case studies for you um, that I will share with you. Mindfulness 
I'd like if you were here with me, I would ask, how, are you, how do you define mindfulness? Some of you may say awareness, being present, being intentional, and all of that is true. So Dr. Jan Kabat-Zinn ran a pain management clinic and about 40 years ago started incorporating mindfulness into his treatment program. And interestingly enough, many of his patients were able to navigate and manage their pain levels um, more efficiently. And so mindfulness is an important component of mindful eating and mindful living is the larger umbrella of mindful eating. So what's mindfulness got to do with it? Who knows, Bernie Brown, um, she is a vulnerability researcher, gave several TED Talks. I really like her a lot. And she says, it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. Most of my friends, most of my American friends I notice are very, very hard workers and much um, harder than my German friends. And I'm noticing that there is a great need for all of us to slow down, to downshift and bring more mindfulness into the present moment. I treated myself to a little dinner last night. The waiter got everything wrong, brought the wrong check. So obviously he did not enjoy a mindful moment there. And it's not always easy to be fully present. And it ranges from being present with our emotions, our needs, to what we put in our mouth, how much time we make for eating, which will be addressed throughout the presentation. So how does mindfulness come into my treatment model, the concept I have designed for working with emotional eaters? How can somebody jump off the hamster wheel and honor their energy levels? What are some non-negotiable behaviors and rituals for living a balanced life? And Eating instead of feeling is a powerful ritual that deserves our compassion and gentle exploration. We can't just say to somebody, don't do this anymore, or a doctor says, exercise more, eat less. Well, that sounds great, but it's very hard to do for any client that I see. All my clients know what they should be eating. So this is not um, at the core of the issue. I have developed this vid visual called the emotional eating iceberg. Weight issues, emotional hunger, and diets hover above the, surf uh, the surface. Underneath is where the real work lies, where people learn to identify. I'm reaching for food. I am not physically hungry. How am I feeling? Am I feeling overwhelmed, anxious, annoyed, worried, any emotion could live underneath the iceberg. So it's critical to understand what am I actually feeding or soothing and learning to identify what's really scratching you. Sometimes I don't really know why I am feeling uneasy and I need to carve out some time to sit with it and identify, oh, okay, this old feeling is being reactivated. So this is a powerful image. It's very simple, but it has helped many clients be more mindful and um, aware of the true needs. My comprehensive intake form um, doesn't ask a lot about food. I have clients rate their life, the various areas of their life on a scale from one to 10. So that gives me a lot of information on what areas are in need of attention, which areas are full and strong so from health, finances, to friends, community, a spiritual connection, and 
self-care, which I split into emotional and physical and, of course, stress levels. Some of my clients ask, what is emotional self-care? And they, they really don't know, and that is okay. Stress levels are typically high. I'd like people to answer now in the chat box, name the two top reasons for emotional eating from your perspective. We have stress and anxiety. Someone's asking if there's a poll. No, you can just enter it into the yeah. into the, the thing. Someone says boredom or habit. Yeah. Someone says depressive mood. Boredom yeah. and sometimes relief from a stressful event. 100%. Nice yeah. answers. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you um, interacting with me. All the can I can I tell you some more? We have a lot more boredom. Oh, yeah, and love please for go food. ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anxiety. Yeah. Um, filling a void, lack of getting a need met, mm -hmm. loneliness. Mm -hmm. I also think there's food is really delicious sometimes, and it's not going to be as delicious when it's cold. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Pleasure. Yes. Food for pleasure. Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, rewarding yourself. Mm -hmm. Time, comfort, a habit from the family. It's it's a comfort thing. Mm -hmm. Preparing for a diet by eating all the quote <laughs> bad stuff. <laughs> Social eating. Uh huh. Anger. Escape. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Responsibilities when my own stuff is not attended to. Yes. Um, we have a lot of really good thank things. you Feel, yes. feeling of lack yes boy thank you so much for thank you that's awesome and Great. all of these are valid i've heard them many many times stress and anxiety are the top two i'd say but everything else filling a void um depressive mood for sure responsibilities um, uncomfortable res chores boy yes. these are some great great Thank yes. you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. And all of this deserves our compassion. These are valid emotions. And they need to be addressed. Otherwise, where do they go? Now, eating instead of feeling works. It's a proven ritual. Uh, many of my clients have been doing this 20, 30, some even 40 years. And we can't just rip that Band-Aid or that self-soothing tool away from somebody. So a therapist has to craft, craft with the client new rituals, which will eventually have the same soothing effect. And um, food is delicious. I like what you said, Carol. Yes. Sometimes we want to finish only because it's so good, completely understandable. And sometimes I have um, the desire after a long day, I'm maxed out mentally fried. I want to go get a glass of wine and French fries at local in Montecito. And then I park my car oh. and I put my hand on my heart and say, hmm, do you really need alcohol or fries right now? Or what do you really need? As if I was asking a little girl and we'll go into inner child work in a moment. And then I realize I really need just time out. I need just Petra time. And so oftentimes after giving myself space and time to explore the core need, I go home. Uh, someone says I use it as a reward as well. Maybe a special food, cocktails, a reward for something well done. Yes. And someone mentions um, procrastination. Eating is the distraction for an unsavory yes. chores. Un, un, yeah, I completely understand. So I like the reward thing and I like all the, the questions that came in. There is nothing wrong with indulging. I refer to this as mindful indulgence. We deserve treats. We deserve to honor. Like today, I'm going to do something really nice for myself because I presented to you all. <laughs> A differentiating question for all of you could be, am I celebrating or am I self-medicating? 
And that's a big difference. There's nothing wrong with planning a beautiful meal with a, with a cocktail or a glass of wine or a beautiful pastry at Via Maestra and a cappuccino that you can enjoy, fully enjoy as a moment of celebration, uh, celebration and life. No guilt needed, just fully enjoy it and love it. If you use food, to, to, if you lean into food as a mood regulator too many times, that gives us information that there may be um, core issues that need to be worked on with a counselor or a coach or a support group. And um, yeah, all these are valid and are part of my intake, which I'm gonna continue right now. So I asked my clients in intake, what are some goals you'd like to achieve six months from today? First answer is usually, well, I want to lose at least 20 pounds. Second answer is the more relevant, the more um, the therapeutically more relevant answer. And one client and said she came from Brazil, married an American, was overweight, very, very unhappy and frustrated at work. She was just eating to, to comfort herself and get through with life. And then I said, well, um, what would you like to do again? And she had written down, I want to be an actress again. I, I was an actress and I was on stage in Brazil. So this poor woman had had given up living her her authentic life, expressing her full potential and living from the heart. So the second answer is so much more interesting to me. What I hear is just phenomenal. I would have never guessed some of the things that people have done in their lives. We move on to internal and external roadblocks. And an external roadblock could be well, the family is always doing this. I have a client, I Zoom with her in Northern California. She has a family of four. And she says, well, I don't really want to change the dynamic. We have a certain way of doing things. If I, if I rattle the cage, I, so it took her courage to carve out time for herself so she could eat a little bit differently and incorporate other meals. and most importantly, carve out time for herself. An internal obstacle could be what? Again, Q&A. What's an internal roadblock to living a full and balanced life and being at peace with food? If you guys could type in a few answers. And while folks are answering that, I think that's a great question. Uh, we have a question if you choose to answer it. Please, I do, yes. Okay, well, how are you going to reward yourself after this presentation? <laughs> yes, thank you. I will go to Evans and get a massage, half on the, uh, on the table, half foot massage, and maybe a glass of champagne later tonight, or wow. go to the beach. I don't know it. I'll feel it out. I'll feel it out. Thank you for asking. <laughs> there you go. And the person says, yay. Um, so an internal block Yes. Be somebody says not knowing how to cook. Ah. Uh, somebody says low self esteem. Mm. Okay. Somebody says the guilt of asking for what I want. Oh my God. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, See, that just warmed my heart. Great responses. Yeah. Thank you for sharing again. Um, yes. Knowing how to cook. Glad I brought this out. What the heck should I cook? Can you guys see this <laughs> book by Mark Hyman? Uh, you can take, I mean, that's a that's an easier fix than um, maybe the reward or other issues or self-esteem. And another uh, comment mm -hmm. is negative thoughts about myself that cause me to eat. Yes, 100%. So busy mom and work life. Oops. Oh, shoot. I just clicked that I answered something when I didn't. Um, Guilt of asking for what I want. I think I said that. Yes. Um, open. Fear of how people react. 
Yes. Busy mom, which we, we said complaining yes. that I'm too busy, but knowing it's just an excuse. Mm. Okay. Um, yes. There's, there's, and I'm sure this could go on. Yeah. And, on. and this yeah. is just one hour we have together. You can imagine, <laughs> uh, imagine how complex and rewarding this work is. And every client is unique. However, our needs of shared humanity are very similar. And well, and a, a, a beautiful woman says here, I know the loving kindness approach, but fear this loving what is will have me gain weight. Oh. Um, and someone says not being able to navigate changing circumstances in the day and inside myself from laziness to stressful interaction and how I feel about that, which is all internal. So I wrote those, I have them memorized and I will as we move on, you will see some of the answers will come. However, know that in one, uh, one hour listening is probably not going to address the deeper issues. And it takes some inner work over time, as I know from my personal life. So thank you. What are you tolerating, not satisfied with in your life? Super important question. Now, some people feel they don't have a choice. I believe we do if we get the right support. Then we shift to inner strengths and inner resources. And I truly believe all of us have enormous strengths and resources. So identifying your strengths, identifying what positive strategies you have used in, to make positive changes in the past are super important. I see another question. Yeah, someone's mentioning sleep apnea. Mm. It's hard when you can't sleep. Yes, yeah, so I would probably hope, oh, okay. I hope you're seeing a sleep specialist. Um, and um, I would not need to know a little bit more, of course. But yeah, not being able to sleep is stressful. Oh, here's uh, yeah the case study, the client from Brazil who was really an actress in her home life. Um, Describe that as a peak experience. When I have clients describe when they felt most alive, I recently signed up a new client, very aware about what she should be eating, struggling with weight. She's withering away in a administrative position that is not filling her heart. She was a science teacher. She would do beautiful exploratory uh, trips with her kids and then her arms went up and she said that's what I made for oh. and her whole being lit up and so my job as her counselor is to help find that path again next question is my favorite it's a non-intellectual question if a fairy showed up right now I would grant you one wish what would you say gives me a lot of insight to a person's longing and um, the reasons for emotional eating because they are not living their most authentic and most fulfilled life, which I understand before I started my business, I was one of these people. <laughs> I was not living my full potential. I was pretty unhappy. Then we shift into, I need to understand how many times a person has been on a diet. Some people just say, I don't have a number, countless. At what age did weight and food become an issue? 90% of my clients said around age seven or 10. Some were taken to Weight Watchers when they were little girls. Some were told, if you don't um, watch out, you look just like Aunt Sally terrible messages, terrible things to say to a little girl. How was food and eating treated in your family? Many of my clients had mothers, grandmothers, or even grandfathers with severe eating disorders, struggling with food and body image issues at, a, at an early end. When they were little, the mother or the father was struggling with weight as well. Petra, it sounds like most of your clients are women or, or you mentioned. Yeah, women. thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, eight, eight out of 10 are women. 
typically over the age of 30. So I don't work with teens. But people find me who have been on this yo-yo and weight cycling roller coaster for a long, long time. And that causes so much pain and suffering and frustration. And research confirms that dieting or diets can leave um, a dieter more frustrated and hopeless before. So I just want anyone who is struggling with weight to know there is hope. Of course, you can learn how to be at peace with food and your body. It's just a longer journey. Now, here's a very important <clears throat> question that I ask, and I want to just state my disclaimer. I do not treat eating disorders such as anorexia or bulimia nervosa. I I help clients with emotional eating, which is on the spectrum of disordered eating, but nothing too severe. I refer those out to a treatment center here in town and specialized therapists. Again, I'd say 95 of my percent of my clients have experienced emotional neglect, physical or emotional trauma. So I need to ask that to um, understand, have they done counseling around the issue before? Um, how is the trauma or the neglect still manifesting in their current life? And I'm going to wait because a question came in. <laughs> the question is, what is emotional neglect? Yes. Emotional neglect is all your physical needs are met. One of my clients was the, the oldest of, I don't know how many siblings. And once she was three, she said, um, nobody picked me up anymore. The, the younger siblings were number one. So it, emotional neglect means not being seen or heard when you needed emotional connection, safe attachment, and um validation of your feelings did i carol did i describe that correctly? i think that, I think that sounds I mm -hmm. think that sounds pretty good yeah yeah all right whatever, for whatever reason emotional needs aren't being met thank you yes yeah. and i know what this feels like i healed it over many many years with my therapist i um grew up with parents who were traumatized from the war, World War II in Germany, and didn't really know how to self-regulate their own emotions. And therefore, I never learned as a child to do these things. But the good news is, like I said, you can learn to do this later in life. I came up with this quote that self-compassion is medicine for the heart. As you, do you need chocolate or a hug comes from a story, a client I worked with who really, really needed her treats, especially sweet treats when she felt anxious. So she shared <clears throat> during a session, she said, Petra, you'd be so proud of me. I was pacing through the kitchen and the house yesterday thinking, what do I need? What do I need? There's no chocolate. <laughs> And she said, I realized I needed a hug. So she walked into the little sitting room where her husband was and said, I need to cuddle. And he held her. How sweet is that? Now, if we don't have a husband or a boyfriend to cuddle with, we can give ourselves a hug. We can tend to the need for comfort in a different way. Do you need chocolate or a hug? So keep remembering it. So now we're shifting to self-compassion. Dr. Kristen Neff, and this is in the on the resource page at the end, uh, the name of the researcher. I believe self-compassion is so important for us to live a, a um, balanced life, to live a life that honors our needs. Now, Tender self-compassion is <clears throat> when we say, oh, I'm hurting. What do I need right now? Or maybe call a friend. You can be warm and soft. 
you cannot always probably be the self-nurturing person sometimes and I know this from my own life it's important to activate fierce self-compassion which is not aggressive fierce is more like going for it during the pandemic there were days where I felt really sorry for myself and then I was like, enough and I would get out of uh, out out from the couch or my bed and say, now I'm going to take a drive. Now I'm going to do something nice for myself. So sometimes motivating change is needed and learning how to discern, am I needing of nurturing or am I needing of, come on, let's do this. And a good question to ask yourself is also, is it time for me to push or pause? And learning how to identify that is only possible if you give yourself a, mo a moment like a mindful pause i'd like you all to close your eyes again for a moment like you did earlier same thing closing your eyes we're going to practice the self-compassion break developed by dr Kristen neff close your eyes Take deep breaths in and out. And again, arriving in this moment. And I'd like you to revisit and recall a stressful moment, maybe from the last week or last month, something that caused you distress. And I'd like you to place both hands over your heart Feel the warmth of your hands over your heart and silently say to yourself, ouch, that was a moment of suffering. This hurts. Suffering is part of life. Others have felt like this before. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the love and compassion I need. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the love and compassion I need. Then keep breathing, breathing in and out. As if you were soothing a small child holding her or him. And with the next breath, gently come back to our session here and open your eyes with no rush. You just practiced what Dr. Kristen Neff and her research team came up with. I have practiced this many times. I find it very helpful to realize, yeah, ouch, this hurts. And yeah, I'm not alone. People have felt like this before. And actually giving yourself love and feeling your heart with a gentle touch of your hands over your heart. You can also ask yourself, she suggests, what do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? May I be strong. May I be patient. May I forgive myself. May I, learn, may I learn to accept myself as I am. You can make up your own as well. So you can do this day or night whenever you need a moment of self-compassion and self-empathy. Since Carol asked, do I typically work with women, yes. And as women, we're born nurturers. We are designed to take care of others and women often put the needs of others first. And I invite all my listeners, <laughs> if that's the case, to put yourself first in line to receive your love and care and to give yourself the oxygen first I mean, you've heard this before on an airplane, they say, give yourself the oxygen first before giving it to your child. Now it's a powerful metaphor. And I truly believe that kindness and self-care start with us 
And that self-care isn't selfish. It's, uh, it's a necessity. So gently and, and um, compassionately increasing your self-compassion and the care you have for yourself is important. Therapeutic goals for any emotional eater is to not use food as a mood regulator. Now, it has worked beautifully for many, many years, so we can't just, like I said earlier, rip that Band-Aid off. To have a healthy but also relaxed relationship with food is important. To end the familiar pattern of worrying about calories and dieting and constant weighing. Understanding that the quick and reliable fix of the emotional eating ritual and the trance state it induces. So trance state can be understood as wanting to numb out, to, to take the edge off and have a release of a relaxation coming over you. Um, what did my client call it the other day? Uh, the relaxation rush. And learning over time to craft and develop healthy, self-nurturing and self-soothing rituals. Now, you may know, yeah, I could call a friend, I could have a cup of tea, but I don't care, I just wanna eat. How would you talk to a child <clears throat> in that moment? You would say, honey, come here, what's going on? Tell me about it. A client who has struggled with weight for a long, long time needs to accept that this is a longer therapeutic process. So average, average treatment, three to six months, sometimes a year, obviously, it takes time to rewire your brain because we're up against many, many years of learned behavior. I truly believe we can learn to be in tune with our body and learn to differentiate physical from emotional hunger. Understanding the true need for comfort and relief. I need a treat really means I need time out. I need some me time. I've given enough. I, I need to just do nothing, for example. And I mentioned earlier, the mindful pause is worth gold if you can, when you reach for your favorite treat to calm down or to self-soothe, to practice that pause, sitting and waiting to understand what is my true need at this moment. And then giving to yourself accordingly. I truly believe it is never too late to remother or reparent yourself and to become the person you needed the most. As you can see, this is not a one session solution. This is a process. Healing is never linear, it takes time. We can practice a loving embrace. We can listen to our hearts. We can strengthen our sense of self and working on self-value and strengthening our self-confidence. Treating yourself as if you were comforting a precious young child in need of comfort. This is a good practice for um, the adult women or men who are listening today. When you wanna hit the fridge late at night, and keep in mind, Everyone I work with eats fairly well throughout the day and come five o'clock, 5.30, something happens because it's finally their time. One client said, once the kids are in bed, I attack the pantry. So we started working on filling her inner pantry with emotional navigational tools to help her calm down and unplug from being on task, running around, cleaning the house, doing her work, et cetera, et cetera. So you could ask yourself as if you were asking a kid, honey, we just had dinner and you had a few cookies. 
let's sit together. What do you need? Do you want me to read to you? Do you want to cuddle? As adults, we need the same loving care. Inner child work is very, very important in my treatment model. I'm going to present to you three um, case studies. One was a night nurse from Cottage Hospital who was unsuccessful with dietary programs and found me. And she described when she would come home from a night shift, she was just, she was running on empty, emotionally, physically fatigued, all of it. And she would eat to fill herself up and consequently gained a lot of weight over the years. So since every client is unique, I did this with her. I asked, um, do you have a beautiful shawl or a scarf? And she said, I do. Do you have a beautiful bowl? And she said, yeah, I do. And I said, do you like tea or do you like broth? She said, oh, I like low sodium broth. I said, okay, let's try this. When you come home from your night shift tomorrow morning, boil the water, sit on the couch, so she did all this. She took the broth, put the shawl around her shoulders and slowly, slowly sipped the broth. That worked for her because the ritual of acknowledging that she really needed to rest and give to herself worked beautifully in her case. Now that's one ritual for one client. The other client, the CPA, smart, successful, type A going for it, could not drive by crush cakes without getting something sweet. She had a full-time job. She had a sick husband at home who would constantly call or text even during our sessions. And she was so burned out and maxed out. So we worked with her on helping her set boundaries, not take all his calls to delegate more. And that over time helped her. She actually was able to say, well, there's crush cakes and would drive by because she had learned different strategies to address what she was really needing. Number three was an older client. She was 71 when she came to me who could not go to sleep and would eat cereal late at night for years and years and years. And she shared with me that when she was a little girl, she witnessed actual fist fights of her parents in the kitchen. And as a child, she started eating the cereal. Somehow she was able to sleep after that and made her feel safe. Now, the core need obviously for this older client was to feel safe. She practiced the self-compassion ritual before closing her eyes and going to bed and focused on affirmations, I am safe, my family is safe, et cetera, et cetera. So she replaced the eating ritual with affirmations and um, meditation practices on safety. So these are just three and every person is unique. I mentioned this earlier, am I celebrating or self-medicating is a good question and be gentle in your inquiry. What am I needing? What is my heart hungry for? What am I feeding? Meaning am I feeding my feelings of loneliness and boredom? There are no taboo foods in my program. I'd like you all to let go of black and white thinking. It just doesn't help. And letting go of self-talk such as, oh, I was a good girl this week, or I cheated, not helpful. <laughs> it's not needed. If you are striving to be become a, a mindful eater and understanding and changing your relationship with food over time. So emotional self-care, I'll play a little video.
honoring your needs. Very important. A counselor friend of mine said, lessons in life come as a whisper, a yell, or a two by four. So my invitation is listen to the whispers. If you're too burnt out, if your neck hurts too much, if you're constantly fatigued, um, get some support. Don't ignore the signals. An emotional self-care can consist of journaling, listening to empowering podcasts, doing mirror work where you look in the mirror, hold your face and say, I really, really love you. I've got your back. And mindfulness meditation would be very helpful. There are three apps that I like. I believe they're listed on the back. And if not, they are Headspace, Calm, and UCLA Mindful. For those of you who are ready to practice mindful eating this week, set the table in a nice manner, make a beautiful, nutritious meal, and eat it without any electronics around. Make sure you eat slowly and savor and enjoy each bite. When I run a workshop, I bring dark chocolate or raisins or grapes, and we do practice mindful eating. And it's it's different from what we do every day. So if you're a desk diner or a computer, in front of the computer diner, two times this week, unplug. Just be with the meal. And another time, you can invite a family friend or make it a family meal, make it special. Tell the people you're practicing mindful eating. And Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist, um, says, while you eat, smile at the person in front of you, which is so sweet. Put a little smile on your face and look at the person eating with you. It's quite different than <laughs> we eat in the U.S. when you look at uh, in and out Burger drive through that has been lost. So we're going against the stream with all of it. But food can be medicine and um, should not be an afterthought. Here's my big conclusion. Always we begin again. If you've tried many things, it's okay. We can, we can begin again. Diets don't work long-term. Research confirms this. So we need to look at the relationship with food. And with ad um, out addressing the emotional eating component, weight management will be temporary in most cases. Acknowledging and honoring that we all have the need for comfort and self-soothing. And the objective for this kind of counseling is to craft new healthy rituals for the emotional eater who has relied on food as a mood regulator. The person who, um, I don't know, somebody said something about filling an inner void or, or all the clients who are not living their full life, not speaking their truth. Speak your truth, don't eat your feelings. Give yourself permission to say no when you mean no and yes when you mean yes, and maybe when you mean maybe. Like I said, give yourself the oxygen first. Self-care and kindness start with us. Good self-care is not a luxury, but a necessity. And stand in your own light. There is only one you. Have your own back. I want to read a beautiful poem to you by Holly Holden. You can just take that in. Today I asked my body what she needed, which is a big deal, considering my journey of not really asking that much. I thought she might need more water, or protein, or greens, or yoga, or supplements, or movement. But as I stood in the shower reflecting on her stretch marks, her roundness where I would like flatness, her softness where I would like firmness, all those conditioned wishes that form a bundle of never quite rightness. She whispered very gently, could you just love me like this? And that 
concludes my presentation. At the end, I have resources for the self-compassion, my website, gratefulness, mindfulness, and some recipes from Blue Zones on, and Dr. Mark Hyman. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, you know, we do have a few more minutes if anybody has any questions that have come up. Um, is there a, a good email, Petra, for people to reach oh, you? Yeah, um, Petra at mindfuleatinginstitute.net. Are we good? I think we're good. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Oh, there's one more. Well, it's, it says thank you very much. Oh, okay, my That's pleasure. Enough. And if anybody has any questions on follow-up, please email me, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone again for being here. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Petra, again, for, for my pleasure, wisdom and, and grace with us today. Thank you. All right, we're going to close out. Lovely job, Petra. Someone says thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.